My name is Anastasia Ferris. I work at the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. We're located in Stockholm. And um, we work on, uh, I think we have 52 communicable diseases under surveillance at ECDC. And we work with the member states in the EU on surveillance and um, monitoring and, and uh, support for those infections. But, um, but we also work with a lot of other partners, including AIDS Action Europe and many other community partners with WHO Regional Office for Europe and UNAIDS, um, especially in our area of HIV AIDS and, and hepatitis and STI. So um, I will bring a little bit of information to kick us off on the monitoring that we do for HIV. This work is led by my colleague, Tamer Nori, who probably many of you have met. He's um, busy today, but he, um, he leads this work for us that I'll be presenting. And the background to what we do for Dublin Monitoring way back to um, the Millennium Development Goals, which um, those who've worked in this field for a while will remember. And um, it, sort of at the time that the Millennium Development Goals were formulated, there was um, an early uh, UNAIDS UNGAS special session in 2001, and that was followed up by the Irish presidency in Dublin um, for this Dublin declaration, where they brought together all the EU countries under their presidency to look at goals for HIV and AIDS, but they also brought some countries from the region, and so it actually covered um, countries beyond just the EU, which was quite unusual um, for a, a European presidency declaration. And um, it laid out certain uh, goals that, um, that countries in Europe wanted to focus on, really reaffirming what had ha been um, put forward in 2001 um, in the Global Gas Declaration. And so the European Commission had different action plans on HIV AIDS back then. And, um, and part of those action plans, they asked um, ECDC to monitor the progress for the EU um, in kind of progress towards the Dublin Declaration and towards the UN goals. The Sustainable Development Goals then f were sort of the, the next generation of the Millennium Development Goals, and um, we talk about these a lot. There was this very high-level meeting on ending AIDS in 2016, and then the EU again followed up on the global you know, UN, I would say, for the EU. We would like to have um, specific progress on this, and the EU should support member states in their commitments to reaching the Sustainable Development Goals including Sustainable Development Goal 3.3 on ending AIDS um, and hepatitis and TB. And so um, uh, a lot of these indicators are, I'll skip over these details. But so the monitoring that we've done at ECDC um, since really back at that early time and um, starting from 2008, um, in, in its inception was, it has always had these principles. They've been refined over time, but the principles behind it are that we should produce useful strategic information um, that is useful at European level, so we can compare across countries, but also useful to countries at national level. So we shouldn't be asking things that aren't useful to, to you. We should seek guidance from um, both national and, and civil society representatives on what's relevant to monitor for the region and that we should adapt indicators, global indicators, um, and, and add things that are important for Europe and for the HIV response in Europe. We also have really, really strongly um, committed to minimizing the reporting burden, so harmonizing with UNAIDS in particular, also with WHO and the European Drugs um, Agency in Lisbon, to ensure that we're not asking the same things in multiple occasions from countries. So we try to be the focal point um, or use data collected by the others so as not to ask again. Um, we prioritize things that are like EU projects or fair data that's already collected and again adapt to the European context and UNAIDS has been fantastic about um, really taking this on board but earlier on there were it was quite important to have a common set globally and there were things in that common set that weren't relevant to the European um, epidemic like orphans and vulnerable children weren't uh, relevant to the HIV response and so we said those don't need to be included, but in our region, uh, issues related to migrants were really important. So we added additional questions on that. Um, and so we've, uh, we do uh, data collections um, through PDF reports. Now we're changing that and, um, and then try to analyze these in 
outputs that are useful for specific stakeholders, such as continuum of care reports, um, reports on key populations, such as this one on people who inject drugs, men who have sex with men, migrants, HIV testing, specific reports, combination regimen. We've had many over the years. And these can be adapted according to sort of your needs. And so if community partners have a specific request, we could plan an output jointly with you um, to do a, an analysis on some specific issues. Um, uh, we this is an example of our advisory group. It changes a bit over time, but um, so this is you know maybe not the most up to date. But we have country partners. So those are those on the left um, who represent their national stakeholders. Um, some such as Sini, who's here with us today, who's been in. Um, in uh, we're really grateful for the participation that you've had over the years from community perspective. We have others who represent that as well. And then um, previously, for example, the Integrate project, um, we had that project also so that we could harmonize indicators across represented. So again, this is from a couple of years ago, but gives an example. We have EMCDDA, WHO, and, and UNAIDS participating. So we try to jointly discuss what we should monitor um, and uh, before we update the questionnaire and, and our analyses. Um, this is an example from 2021, but just in terms of we jointly in these advisory group meetings set priorities on what we want to look at and then um, what the gaps would be um, there, thereafter. And so understanding that we don't have very good data at that time in 2021 on PrEP, on mortality, on stigma and discrimination. And so then we've, we've tried to work on projects at ECDC and with partners to improve data on those areas so that we can then have data to monitor. Um, some of the data sources we use, um, so we have a questionnaire, but then we supplement this with surveillance data and diagnosis or new, new infections that are reported. We also um, bring in data on people who inject drugs from the drugs agency, uh, different commission projects such as the last EMIS survey, and now we'll, we're working with EMIS to, um, for a, a new survey. We have brought in things from, for example, web surveys, um, we did it, um, from ILGA, from a glo the global database on travel restrictions. So really bringing in and capitalizing on data that is available. And then of course, with UNAIDS and GAM indicators where we both will pull from data that UNAIDS has, but also provide data to UNAIDS um, so that we can get the best data for, for both global and European regions. Um, I mentioned again SDG3, so um, all of our monitoring efforts now have moved really from this initial, you know, what's stated in the Dublin Declaration from, from um, way back 15 years ago isn't really completely relevant for the, the today's um, prevention and control of HIV. Um, you know, this was pre-PrEP, pre-treatment is prevention. It was um, many of the, the sort of the indicators that are listed there aren't, aren't really relevant for today, but um, we've adapted this to under the spirit of the Dublin Declaration to look at, um, you know, focusing our efforts around the SDGs and um, and also the indicators that um, UNAIDS has put forward on, on ND8, so the 95, 95, 95, and um, some of the others on the less than 10% with stigma and discrimination on policies and um, and people linked to, to a specific services that are needed. Um, uh, so, you know, these are the examples of the kind of things where we try to use epidemiology in order to guide um, the monitoring we're doing, um, but, and then to really understand that we have a lot of diversity in our region, and so um, this is important to us in, in that um, the you know, sort of the prevention and control policies, they should be evidence-based, they should be implemented, but uh, we do have quite different um, uh, epidemics across where we have a much higher burden in the East. Um, but also a difference in terms of the um, those who are most affected, where we see large proportion of um, cases due to sex between men in countries in the West and in the center, whereas in the East, we see a lot more cases that are driven by injecting drug use and also in heterosexual populations. Um, the proportion born abroad is also really different across our region, where half of those who are newly diagnosed with HIV in the West are born in another country and uh, very few in the East. Although this is changing also with uh, the situation with uh, from Ukraine, this is one example. Um, Nina asked me to give a couple of examples, and um, where we've used monitoring data in partnership with community and with countries that uh, are in Europe to uh, try to elicit change. And so, a lot of the work on prep um, in discussion with our advisory group and those of you working on on the ground. 
we have um, it started this map. This was something that, that Tamar uh, led and early on this map was completely blue. Most countries were not implementing PrEP at all. And this was really impactful to show that, you know, we had a few pilot projects um, in France and in the UK, then Belgium and in the Netherlands started with, with pilot projects, research projects really. But, um, but just to, to use this map to show that like, okay, it's, it's available in these places, but maybe not as a national program. And then as countries started to change the policies and, and implement national programs, we saw really quick change and a lot of requests for this map to be updated to say, oh, now in Slovenia, you know, we have this uh, program now that we've started. Could you please, we'd like to look differently on your map. And this is something that we've seen has been um, useful, I think, because it's it's been in high demand and, um, and impactful in terms of uh, a little bit of peer pressure across the region on, on this issue of prep policies. Um, and, but we also try to, you know, a policy we know doesn't make a, you know, coverage. And so we've tried um, together with the advisory group to look at this and how um, we might then measure what is the number of people on prep or what is the coverage of prep. And this is a really tricky issue that we're still struggling with. But um, the green bars are people that have received PrEP at least once. This is 2021 data, so not fully updated. And then the red dots are the percentage who were getting PrEP in that year for the first time. So we see that some countries, for example, um, Germany uh, or France maybe is a good example, has very high numbers of people that received PrEP at least once. About half of them, or nearly half, had received it for the first time um, last year. So or in 2021, that was. So a lot of new users um, who were, you know, uptake was, was really high or really low numbers in a lot of other countries with high proportions receiving it for the first time. So we see these countries were in their uh, sort of early stages of, of rollout and demand is definitely not met. Um, and then trying to fill this out, with, you know, tracking the barriers to prep implementation so that it's clear, you know, what are the concerns? Is it about cost? Is it about um, concerns about STI spread, et cetera? Um, and then together with the EMIS collaboration, we estimated the prep gap. And this was very impactful where we looked at the percentage of people, this was the old EMIS, so it was in 2017, who are currently taking prep. And then we looked at the to use PrEP if it was available to them. And we see a very, very big difference between the proportions in each of these countries. And um, in 2017 or 2019, when we published this, we could use this to then say, you know, there's a huge unmet demand for PrEP um, in nearly all countries in across Europe. And this is something that we'd like to repeat now when EMIS 2023 is conducted to see hopefully some progress on this indicator. Um, but also probably um, we think that there is still quite a bit of undemand, unmet demand um, and that, that needs to be addressed. Um, and then a second example is the ART initiation policies. And this is also something we've seen a lot of change in the past 10 years. Um, where in 2024, only four countries had it, were implementing treatment regardless of CD4 count. And then we saw a change in WHO and EX guidelines and very rapid change across time in terms of the number of countries who were doing test and treat policies. Um, but still, um, interestingly, in 2022, a few countries who, had, um, who didn't have test and treat but were only treating at 500, for example. And I believe that's changed since. Um, and then one third example is the availability of ART for undocumented migrants. And this is something that um, it affects a small number of people, but, um, but it varies you in terms of who is able to access treatment in countries. So even though it's available, it's not available to all um, in many countries. And this is in 2018, and I didn't clip in the most recent map, but there has been some positive change um, in, on this indicator um, after bringing awareness to it and really repeating the message again and again. I wanted to end with just a few examples of good practice in terms of community monitoring or community-led monitoring uh, for HIV. We've seen excellent examples across the region of joint reporting. We used to have a system um, which UNAIDS also used to have where there would be a community report and a, a national report. And what we found was that um, this, either the community and national levels were meeting and reporting the same things, or they weren't at all. And, um, and that this, we saw that there was a bigger opportunity in bringing people together to have a conversation around the reporting. And so what we have put forward as a good practice is that 
um, national level who is responsible officially to reporting to us for the Dublin monitoring for HIV, that it um, we ask who from the community is involved in this reporting, please put their information here. And we suggest that this be done as a joint exercise. We see that this is the case um, in foremost countries. And, um, and that many countries have said back to us that, that Dublin and the request for reporting provides an opportunity for stakeholders to sit down together to sort of divide up the questionnaire in terms of who has um, data on which indicators, and that this is a collective exercise that, um, that is done by many countries. And um, some countries, um, the UK is one example, do data providers meetings where they use um, the feedback, all of the data that's collected, for example, by the UK HSA to those who are providing at a regional level as well as to community partners and we think that this is an excellent example of a way that to feedback the data in a sort of collated manner so it can be used at local and, and community levels but also to ask questions and interrogate things that don't seem really correct um, or, or where their understanding maybe isn't uniform. And then we've also seen a few examples. Um, oh, this uh, Italy, for example, is one place. Um, I think also Denmark had an example of community um, agencies it really, it, especially during COVID, um, pitching in and actually leading the reporting in response for Dublin monitoring when um, national level authorities were really, really busy with COVID. And, um, and this is something that we saw and it worked really, really well. There was an excellent collaboration in, in those countries um, across national and, and community level partners. And, and this is something where, um, yeah, it, it really did work in partnership. Um, so those are a few things I think we could maybe discuss more as we go. Um, other ideas or, or questions, but this is what I wanted to share with you to kick us off today. So thank you very much. And um, also thanks to many, many of you who participate in our advisory group as focal points um, and, um, and to all of the people across Europe who, who are part of this work. And most thanks to my colleague um, Tamar, who is our brain, this is his brainchild and, and, and group.